Hey folks, today I get a complete in-depth review and 17 things to know about the new DJI Avada FPV drone. Now the purpose of this drone is essentially it replaces this behemoth with this little guy right here. But in reality, it's a wee bit more complex than that with a lot of different caveats to be aware of. So in this review, I'm gonna talk through all the features of the new Avada and how they differ in certain areas compared to the existing DJI FPV drone, as well as the, how they might differ to something like this, a more traditional Cinewhip type drone. Now you'll find the YouTube chapters along the bottom down there. I divided up things roughly into the hardware features, the camera features, the software features, and then just some other dibs and dabs, dibs and dabs, tidbits along the way. Starting off first though, I've gotta explain the hardware. Not the old hardware, but the new hardware, because there's a lot of different pieces and then from there, It'll make sense when I get into the pricing. First off, there's the drone itself. Then there's the goggles. These are the FPV or first person view goggles. You put them on your head like this and you can see what's going on in the drone, the camera on the front of the drone, in the goggles themselves. If you're new to FPV drones, this essentially just replaces the screen you have on your remote control with something that's right against your eyes. So that's all you see. And then on top of that, you need some sort of controller. Uh, there's bundles that include what's called a motion controller, which is like a free floating joystick of sorts that's designed to be more towards beginners. Or you can use the FPV controller, which is a bit kind of more traditional controller. And within that, you can reconfigure the hardware in this for different modes, depending on what your preferences are. And that segues nicely into the pricing. So starting off with the base, if you have some of these other pieces already, this base piece here is $629 for just the drone itself, including one battery. However, if you don't have those pieces, you will need goggles and some sort of controller. So DJI has a kit that has the old goggles that you see right here uh, with the drone itself, as well as the motion controller for $1,168. Or you can go with the new goggles two, just two by the way. So this is goggles two, the small one, and this is V2, the big one. It's confusing, I don't understand why they did that. Point being though, these new goggles have some new fancy stuff I'll talk about in just a second. These new goggles plus the remote controller and the drone are $1,388. And if you want the remote controller itself with the joysticks, then you need to buy this by itself. But you may already have this if you've got this thing back here or you just bought it for the heck of it along the way. And then finally, there is the Fly More Combo Kit, which is essentially a battery-like strip right here that you plug USB-C into the side, uh, and then charges two extra batteries that come with it. And in total, it can charge four batteries, one, two, three, four. Uh, the batteries just kind of like dangle off there. It looks silly, but it actually works pretty well. Though you do need to buy your own charger into the side of this, a 60 watt charger, ideally, uh, for the fastest possible battery charging. Speaking of batteries, by the way, each one of these batteries will last you 18 minutes on a charge in windless conditions. That's what DJI Specs does. I'd say it's like more in the 13 to 16 minute range, which I know sounds short if you're coming from something like the mini series that has, you know, up to 45 minutes of battery time. Uh, but for FPV drones, that's actually pretty good. Uh, the old unit here had 20 minutes of battery time, so two minutes longer. Obviously though, these batteries are a heck of a lot bigger. So if you look at the two sizes right here, side by side, the Vada battery is absolutely tiny in comparison to this behemoth of a battery. And that gets right into the weight side of it. Uh, this new drone is 410 grams versus 795 grams for the big one. That does though put it over the 250 gram limit that does impact certain regions in terms of regulations, things like that. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And also while this video is definitely not a full comparison between the Avada and the original FPV drone there, uh, top speed is one notable difference. Uh, the Avada here goes 97 kilometers an hour in manual mode as its top speed or 50 kilometers an hour in sport mode versus this thing here cruises up to 140 kilometers an hour in manual mode and a little under 100 kilometers an hour in sport mode. And also just practicality of using it indoors, as we'll get to in a little bit, you can see here the props are not protected in the old one versus the new one. They have the prop guards all the way around. Now, a quick note, if you are finding this video interesting and useful, this is a great time to whack that like button. It really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. The next new thing to know is these new goggles. So setting aside the drone for a second, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are the new DJI goggles 2. Not V2, V2 is a big one, just two is the little one here. Uh, they're almost like half the height or so, maybe two thirds the height, but the most notable difference is actually on the inside of them. If I flip it over right here, you can see inside of it. Uh, first off, I can go ahead and move the diopters left and right there just to adjust them to what my eyes are. I can also adjust the focus directly in it itself. So you can see doing this right here, will adjust the focal plane. I can't easily show you that because the camera just simply won't focus within the goggles, uh, but it makes it really ideal for people with glasses to go ahead and just make these adjustments on the goggles directly. Additionally, internally, there's now micro OLED 
OLED screens. Again, something I can't really show you very easily. Uh, and they've also increased the resolution as well. From a goggle strap standpoint, it just simply goes around the back of your head, just like this, pretty straightforward. Uh, there is no top strap like there used to be in the past. On the side right here is an entire touch panel that you'll use to navigate the menu system. Uh, and the antenna just simply pop down like this versus the old one that you had to remove if you were traveling or something like that. Uh, there was four of them. Uh, these other ones just simply pop down. The downside though is the range is a little bit less. But before we talk about the range numbers, it's important to understand that DJI does not produce different versions of the products from different countries. That's how it used to happen years ago, but these days it's all electronically controlled based on GPS telling it where you are in the world. So in the case of a North American based user, someone in the US, it'll go and it's called FCC mode. In that case, it gets up to 10 kilometers of range. However, if you live in Europe, then you're under what's called CE rules. In that case, these goggles are limited to two kilometers of range, which is quite different than the CE rules for these ones here that limit it to six kilometers in range. There's also a range setting as well for China that's also six kilometers on these goggles here. And then different countries fall into one of those two or basically three different categories. In my case, as I mentioned, I live in Europe. And so let's talk about it in the context of that. First off is indoor usage. Here around the studio, I've had no problems at all, no range issues, no connectivity issues. I live in a giant concrete box. This whole studio is a giant concrete box uh, and things bounce around just fine within here. That'd probably be different if you were like trying to film a stadium or something that's much, much bigger. Yet despite that, I've had no real problems in range here. So then we get to the next section, which is range outdoors and like wide open. So here we are out over the ocean. Uh, and in this case, I'm getting about a thousand meters of range before I start seeing dropouts in the goggles themselves. Uh, and that's basically the signal degradation goes down and then it says I'm reaching the end of the range. Now you can debate on whether or not a thousand meters is meaningful for your particular flying. Uh, for most FPV flying, considering how far the battery is gonna get you, it's probably not a huge deal. The last kind of range testing is within wooded areas. And in that case, again, using these goggles with this remote control, but it's the goggles that matter here. Here, uh, I was seeing dropouts in between two and 300 meters uh, in like loose trees, nothing super dense or anything like that, but there was a number of times where I basically had to stop because it got too fuzzy on the goggles and I lost signal. And the one time I had to go walk a whole long ways to regain signal. And the drone was always viewable between me and my observer. Uh, but in this case, the trees being almost peak summer or peak leaf, if you will, uh, just meant that it wasn't getting a lot of great range there. So maybe something where you want to go back to these other goggles instead, which have much higher range uh, if you're doing something that requires that. The good news, by the way, is these ones are cheaper. So that's something to keep in mind. So now let's talk a little bit about the drone itself and the camera. Uh, first off, there is a single camera on the front of it. That's notable because many FPV drones will have two cameras. So if I look at this cinema right here, I have, I've got one camera for controlling it, this piece up there, out of the way. And then a second camera up top, for the actual recording of the video that I would use and publish on YouTube or whatever it may be. Uh, so in this case, this single camera does both of those, just like it did on the original FPV drone from DJI. Uh, this camera is also fully gimbaled, so you can see that right here. It's not powered on right now, so it's fine to touch this. Uh, and this allows me to control the gimbal up and down, but also keeps this footage being silky smooth. The Avada has a couple different resolution options, including 4K up to 60 frames per second and 2.7K up to 120 frames per second. Note though that your frames per second on the drone are driven by which goggles you have. So if you have the newer sleeker goggles, you only get up to 100 frames per second in 2.7K mode uh, versus the older goggles actually get you 120 frames per second in 2.7K mode. So also note, you can shoot footage in decent like if you want to, so you can color grade a little bit later on. Now, in addition to all the resolution options and the gimbal itself, you also have three different stabilization options. Uh, so these are electronic stabilization options that are applied after the fact. Virtually every camera these days has electronic stabilization. So there's not like the boogeyman it used to be of years past, uh, you generally want this stuff. Still, if you want to turn it off entirely, you can do that. You can turn it off into settings and then do your own stabilization after the fact. Keep in mind, you're still gonna have the gimbal there, so it's not like completely lost. Uh, the second option is the base, which is rock steady stabilization. That came from their action cameras and does a pretty good job at making things relatively smooth. And then the third option is called horizon steady. And that essentially does what it implies. It keeps the horizon steady up to a certain amount anyways. Not all of those options are available in all settings. For example, there is both a normal wide and ultra wide lenses up to 155 degrees field of view. Again, depends on really what you want to shoot. If you're trying to go for something that's really tight and really fast moving, you probably want to go ultra wide so it gives that feel 
feeling a speed quite a bit more, but ultra wide tends to have a little bit of a fisheye look to it versus the normal frame does not have the fisheye look to it. Now, when it comes to recording all that, there's actually 20 gigs of internal storage inside of it, which is handy in case you forget the micro SD card. And fear not, there is a micro SD card slot that's located in the worst possible place. It's right here in between the props down there, this little door that you pop open or try to pop open. And the key is to pop this open without breaking the props or your fingernail or anything like that. And you can see that little SD card slot right there next to the USB port, which is actually in an even worse location than the micro SD card slot, just because then you got to put the cable into that and not all cables will fit into that little hole. I appreciate that DJI is trying to make things in the smallest possible package, but really when it comes to like the next version of this, please put those two things anywhere else other than right next to the props themselves. So let's start talking some of the flying bits. Uh, first off, there are three modes within the Avada. Uh, there's normal mode, sport mode, and manual mode. Uh, in the case of normal mode and sport mode, you can use the motion controller here. That's part of some of the bundles. Uh, but if you want full manual mode, you will have to use the DJI FPV controller that you see right here. Normal mode and sport mode are mostly split up by the speeds that you go to. You can see the speeds on the screen right here. And then in manual mode, which is also called acro and most other drones, uh, basically allows you to do flips and things like that. One of the things to keep in mind is that most of the focus and FPV drones over the last year or two has been more around the cinematic side than the acro side. There's nothing wrong with the acro side, but that's sort of a different category than what DJI is going for here, where they're more looking at the cinematic side of it. And in that case, you can do the vast majority of what you need to do in sport mode, where it's more about speed and precision flying than it is really about doing flips and things like that. Still, if you want to do that, this drone can certainly do that, just like the existing DJI FPV drone did. And the good news is that if you already have this, you can get this and just use your existing controller and goggles. Now, as you can see on Nevada, it's got these prop guards around it. And that's because one of the areas that's exploded in interest over the last probably 12 to 18 months is indoor videos with FPV drones. You've undoubtedly seen like fly through the stadiums or headquarters or things like that. Uh, those are mostly shot on these sort of drones or even smaller drones than that. Uh, and again, designed to be indoors and designed to be safe around people and having the prop guards does that. These prop guards here are made of pretty darn thick plastic. Like you would have to really something pretty hard to break this. But the downside though, is that compared to this drone, which has foam on the outside here, uh, when this hits a wall and stuff like that, just flying along, it kind of bounces off a little more like gracefully. This just, it didn't, doesn't tend to bounce off super gracefully in my testing here. When I do like lightly bounce or lightly touch a wall, I'm not talking like full ascend. I'm just talking like a light grazing of the wall. So I'm having a ton of fun flying indoors with this, uh, just like I have with my other FPV drones, uh, but just kind of to push the limits where I can get to. And you can see I've, I've taken a couple hits on this, uh, some stuff there, some marks there and so on, uh, but it keeps on ticking. And aside from that little bit of drift that I've already kind of learned to compensate for, I found it pretty stable here inside. Now, while I mentioned there is these downward obstacle avoidance sensors, there is no other obstacle avoidance sensors on the unit itself. And these aren't really obstacle avoidance sensors, they're really just depth sensors. They're designed to tell the drone how far it is from the ground. Uh, it works from half a meter up to 20 meters, uh, and that is really used in landing so that it can automatically land itself when it's outdoors, and it gets close to the ground, and it knows when to not hit the ground essentially and automatically land itself. So that is one big difference between this drone and most of other DJI's consumer drones is they do have more optical avoidance sensors around them on the sides and the top, on the front, back, etc. that this simply does not have. The good news though here is that there are some emergency options in this. Uh, the first one is automatic return to home. Uh, so if this loses connectivity for some reason, it'll return to home automatically. It'll fly up to your pre-designated height. Uh, so I set mine at 50 meters. And then from there, it'll fly back to your spot that you took off from and land itself automatically. Automatically. So again, if you were to like throw the controller and the goggles into the water, it'll do that automatically for you. Likewise, if you're in some mode where you just feel out of control, you can use the emergency brake at any point in time to instantly stop the drone where it is and hover it in midair. That's something that's missing on most other FPV drones, where if you get yourself in a pickle, you're going down with the ship. Now, in the event that you do plow into the trees, you've got more options there to get this drone back. Uh, the first one is that you can go ahead and review the last 30 seconds of footage. Uh, so that can be useful to figure out exactly which tree you hit or where that drone might be located. You can then turn on the beeping option. So again, if you're like in deep weeds or whatnot, you can turn the beep on and that'll help you find exactly where it is in the weeds. And then finally, there's turtle mode. Uh, meaning if you've gone ahead and you bonked into something and crashed, uh, but the drone is upside down, maybe a couple hundred meters away from you, you can use turtle mode to go ahead and automatically flip back over like this. And then you can take off from there. It's just a toggle in the menus and it just simply flips it over because you're turtle upside down. Another assistance type feature is that in the goggles, it'll show your home point using augmented reality. Uh, so on the actual video screen itself, 
uh, it'll show the dot of where it took off from, which is typically where you are as well. So you can kind of use that to judge where you are and fly back to your location. Next, before we talk about two app features, I got to talk about probably my favorite feature on this screen recording. Uh, so in the past, you could record it into the goggles themselves, but only the feed that was coming in. It didn't actually record all the data overlays of what you see in the goggles, uh, so all the menus and that kind of stuff, but you can now finally do that. Uh, when you swipe down from the top and hit the record button, it'll go ahead and actually record everything on the screen itself, which is super awesome. So you get that recording on the SD card that's located on the goggles that you see right there. And of course, then there's a the high resolution footage that records the drone itself. Next, if you've got your phone right here, you can use a DJI Fly up uh, using the cable to the goggles. And this is the one area where I think it all kind of falls a bit short of what I would expect from a DJI product uh, in that there isn't any wireless connectivity from the drone to your phone. So there's no Wi-Fi, there's no Bluetooth to pair that way to download footage and kind of preview footage like that. Instead, you have to use the cables to the goggles. It's all just a bit cumbersome. And it just feels like for all the capabilities of all of DJI's other consumer drones, including drones that are much cheaper than this, uh, they just didn't put the couple of dollar Wi-Fi Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip in there for that sort of ease of use stuff that's really handy as a consumer. The app also allows you to update the firmware as well. Now DJI also has a second app called Virtual Flight and that allows you to use the controllers that you have and the goggles to practice flying using basically a simulator app on your phone. So that is actually pretty cool and really handy way to get comfortable with an FPV drone, in particular in manual mode where the controls are significantly different and the learning curve is usually in the dozens of hours time frame uh, than it is in sport and normal mode where you can pretty much just kind of pick it up and start flying. Now, overall, I'm pretty impressed with Avada, uh, especially for indoor usage, as well as the base price of this being pretty similar to the DJI Mini 3. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is that all the automated modes, all of like the quick shot modes and all that kind of cinematography stuff simply is not in this drone at all. And the thing is, there's no good reason for it not to be in this. It's just software. There's plenty of battery to be able to have some of those quick shot modes if you wanted to do something like that, to be able to take this and have this be a bit of that one-stop shop versus if I'm traveling, I'm going to need really kind of two different drones depending on what I want to do. And that's something I hope to see after the original DJI FPV drone was released. And unfortunately, we just don't see it here today. Maybe down the road, we'll see some of the updates around that area. But for right now, this is true and through an FPV drone uh, and none of the other cinematography or quick shots or any of the automated modes are here on Avada today. Still, if you want like a ready to fly solution, it's really hard to beat this. Sure, it's gonna be more expensive than this drone is here. There is no doubt about it. But there's also the simplicity aspect of having batteries that aren't gonna catch fire on you. You don't have all the craziness of the charging side of it everything just kind of works. And it's really easy to use, which is positive as well. So again, this won't appeal to everyone, but I think unlike this one, I would not recommend this to beginners. This actually does make a lot of sense for beginners because there's a complexity of all these pieces here just simply isn't there, it just works. And that's something that's sometimes worth paying for. With that, hopefully you found this interesting or useful. I've got a full beginner's guide that should be published in the next couple of days, somewhere up here, as well as a comparison that I'm gonna do between the Avada and the Mini 3 Pro, since they are priced almost identically. Uh, so be on the lookout for both of those. Again, as always, if you found this video interesting or useful, whack that like button at the bottom there, or hit subscribe for both of those videos and plenty more. September's looking pretty crazy in the sports tech realm. With that, have a good one.